In this video, I'm going to be going through the solutions to several pre-calculus review problems. These are intended for calculus students who are right at the beginning of the semester just to make sure that you have the appropriate algebra skills that we're going to need throughout the semester. If you're one of my students and any of these things seems confusing or you're not sure, uh, feel free to stop by my office and come see me um, and get some extra help and uh, work through the solutions to these. So the first couple of questions, we're talking about scientific notation. This is going to be something that's going to kind of come up sporadically throughout the semester. So let's talk a little bit about how that works. So we talk about 87 million in scientific notation. The idea here is that when we multiply by 10, we move the decimal point. So if I take 8.7 and multiply that by 10, that's 87. So what has happened is this decimal point has moved one space to the right. And so I, instead of 8.7, I have 87. If I take that same 8.7 and multiply it by 100, 10 squared, that moves the decimal point two spaces. If I multiply it by a higher power of 10, it moves more spaces. So the question is, how many places do I have to move that decimal point to get 87 million? So million is six zeros. And since I'm starting with 8.7, we always want to start with a number between 1 and 10 for our scientific notation. So we've got 8.7. Uh, well, that means that we have to move that decimal point seven places. It started here, right between the eight and the seven, and it went one, two, three, four, five, six, seven spaces there to the end. So the scientific notation here would be 8.7 times 10 to the seventh power. Now, scientific notation can also be used to express very small numbers, right? We just used it to express a very large number. Now we're going to use it for very small numbers. So here what we're doing is multiplying by negative powers of 10. So if I take 3.75, right, so again, I take the numerical part and I write it as a number between 1 and 10. So in this case, that would be 3.75. If I multiply that by 10 to the negative 1, that's going to move one, uh, the decimal point one space to the left. So that's going to give me 0 0.375. So that decimal point here has moved one space to the left, and that ended up giving me 0.375. If I multiply by 10 to the negative 2, that's going to multiply, that, and that's going to move my decimal point two spaces to the left. So I'm going to get 0 0.0375. So again, this decimal point has moved two spaces to the left. There wasn't a zero here before, so I have to put a zero in there so that I have a place to put the decimal point. And so on and so on. And then again, the question is, how many places do I have to move the decimal point to get 0 0.0000375? So my decimal point started between the 3 and the 7. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 spaces, which means I'm multiplying 3.75 times 10 to the negative 6. Now, just a note here, when you use your calculator and express these either very large numbers or very small numbers, usually, uh, especially if you're using the TI calculator that I recommend, the notation that you're going to see on the calculator involves the letter E. So on the calculator, the way that this number would show up is it would look like 3.75 and then it's like a little capital E negative 6. So this just means 3.75 times 10 to the negative 6. So that capital E means times 10 to the, if you can kind of just remember that. So E here means times 10 to the whatever number is after it. Don't get that capital E confused with our special number E that we use for natural logarithms, the 2.718 number. It's not the same E at all, so make sure that you've got those separate in your mind. Okay, moving on to some other things. Here we're talking about some radicals, so square root of 100. Hopefully this seems pretty simple to you. Square root of 100 is just going to be 10 because 10 squared is 100. Now, if you're thinking, well, isn't it plus or minus 10? Isn't there some plus or minus thing that we do with square roots? We're going to talk about that uh, in one of the later problems. But in this case, it's literally just what is the square root of 10? And when we say the square root, what we mean is the principal square root. So when we just see a square root symbol, that just means the positive square root. Now, when we look at this problem, simplify the square root of x squared, at first glance, it seems like this is also pretty simple. Oh, square root of x squared is x since x squared is, well, x squared. But the problem is that's not necessarily true. 
because what if x is negative, right? x can be anything. x is a variable. It could stand for, for theoretically anything. And if x is, let's say, negative 10, then this is the square root of negative 10 squared. Negative 10 squared is 100, and we just got through talking about how the square root of 100 is just positive 10. So it's not true that the square root of x squared is x. What is true is that the square root of x squared is the absolute value of x, because the square root, the square root, the principal square root, always has to be non-negative. And so in this case, the square root of x squared is going to be the absolute value of x. Now again, that's not plus or minus. The, the plus or minus idea comes up when we have uh, when we're solving an equation, where sometimes we get a positive and a negative solution. Here, there's only one square root, and it has to be the non-negative one. And so that's what these absolute value bars are going to do. So that's going to be our solution here. Talk about fractional exponents. These are going to be things that are going to show up occasionally. So when we have something like this, 16 to the 3 halves, what 16 to the 3 halves means is either, there's two ways to think about this, 16 cubed, and then we take a square root. And the two there is essentially telling us that I have a square root. We usually don't write the little two on our square root symbol, but we could if we wanted to. It's just indicating that it's a square root rather than, let's say, a cube root or a fourth root or so on. Or, and it's equivalent, it's the square root of 16 cubed. Now, 16 cubed, I don't know what that is off the, offhand, and even if I did, then I have to take the square root. That's going to be a big number. So I'm going to choose to do it this way because I know what the square root of 16 is. I know that that's 4, and then 4 cubed, that's 4 times 4 times 4. That turns out to be 64. So if you've got a calculator, it doesn't really matter. You can do it either way. You can also just type in 16 to the 3 halves on your calculator. Just make sure that when you do that, you put the exponent in parentheses. So a common mistake here is to just write 16 to the 3 over 2, and then the order of operations on the calculator is going to give you 16 cubed and then divide your answer by 2. That's not what you want. So make sure that you put the exponent in parentheses there. All right, again, playing with exponents. Here we're using our rules of exponents and our order of operations. So we've got x to the fifth multiplied by x squared cubed. So x squared cubed, that's an exponent, so we've got to do that first. So we're going to multiply those exponents together. 2 times 3 is 6. And then we've got two exponential expressions with the same base multiplied together. We add those exponents together, and we're going to get 5 plus 6 is 11. So we get x to the 11th as our final answer here. All right, again, playing with order of operations. Here I'm asking you to take 8 minus 5 squared plus 2 plus 5 squared all over 9 minus 3, thinking about doing that without a calculator and then checking your answer with the calculator. So when we're doing it without a calculator, we're just using our regular old order of operations. So most people know this as PEMDAS, P-E-M-D-A-S. So that's parentheses, exponents, multiplication and division are actually two, uh, two parts of the same thing. And then addition and subtraction, again, those go together as well. So the first thing we're going to do is parentheses. Now, when you look at this expression, you might think to yourself, oh, there aren't any parentheses in that expression, so I can just go ahead and move on. But the problem is that that big fraction actually has implied parentheses in it. This top of this fraction is grouped together. We don't typically write the parentheses there because we don't need to, but there really are those parentheses there. So we really have to figure out the top of that fraction and the bottom of that fraction before we can divide. Right? If we don't actually figure out the top and the bottom, we're not going to be able to do that division problem. So we'll figure that out first. So I've got 8 minus 5 squared. On the top of that fraction, 2 plus 5 squared, that's 2 plus 25, that's 27. And then 9 minus 3, that's 6. So parentheses taken care of. Now exponents, I've got a 5 squared, that's 25. And then I've got multiplication and division. 27 divided by 6, I can simplify that. So 27 is 9 times 3, 6 is 2 times 3, so those 3s divide out, and I get 9 over 2, and then I'm doing my addition and subtraction. So 8 minus 25 is a negative 17, plus 9 over 2. I can create a common denominator here, 17 times 2 is 34, and then negative 34 plus 9 is negative 25, divided by 2. So that would be my final answer there. 
Now, main thing to worry about when you're putting this in the calculator is again those implied parentheses. So when you're typing this in your calculator, eight minus five squared, no problem. But now I've got to put the two plus five squared in parentheses in my calculator and then divide by the nine minus three. So just make sure that you're grouping that together. Now, some calculators will actually give you a big fraction to type the things into, but just in case, it's still a good idea to use those parentheses. Okay, so now we're simplifying an algebraic expression. So the word simplify here just means to carry out the operations and to collect like terms and write this expression in the simplest possible way. So we've got some multiplications here that we can distribute. So we've got three X minus five, not much we can do with that right at the moment. But the 6 times x minus 4, we're going to distribute that multiplication. 6 times x is 6x. 6 times 4 is 24. And now we've got minus 2 times 4 minus 5x. So this minus 2, this whole minus 2 here, is going to get distributed through that parentheses. So minus 2 times 4 is minus 8. And minus 2 times minus 5x is positive 10x. So the minus 2 gets distributed through, and minus times a minus is a plus. Now we're gonna collect like terms. So 3x, 6x, and 10x, we add those all together. 3x plus 6x plus 10x is 19x. And then negative five, negative 24, negative eight, add all those together, that's going to be minus 37. So 19x minus 37 is my simplified form of this expression. Okay, now let's talk about inequalities, interval notation. So when we say x greater than six, we're describing a part of the number line. So here's my number line. So positive infinity is over here, negative infinity is over here. I mean, not really, those aren't really numbers, but we usually orient our number line from left to right. So the negative numbers go to the left, the positive numbers go to the right. Six is somewhere here in the middle. And so when I say x is greater than six, the numbers that I'm talking about are, well, not six, but everything bigger than six. So all of these numbers that I'm shading in red here, all of those numbers are what I'm talking about. So that's kind of the visual representation of what we're talking about. When we say interval notation, what we're talking about is the beginning of the interval and the end of the interval. So the beginning of the interval is on the left, that's the six. The end of the interval, well, it doesn't really have an end. It goes on forever in the positive direction. And so the way that we indicate that is we write the symbol infinity. Again, infinity is not a number, but this is just a way for us to indicate that this interval goes on forever. Now, around those two endpoints, we write either a square bracket or a round parentheses. We write a round parentheses if the number, or the infinity in this case, is not included, and we write a square bracket if the number is included. Well, I don't want six, so I write a round parentheses. And since infinity is not a number, we never write a square bracket around infinity. Infinity is never actually included in the interval because it's not a number. And so this would be my interval notation uh, indicating my numbers that are greater than six. So same idea here, I've got my number line. Now I've got two numbers to worry about, negative three and four. And again, as usual, we wanna orient our number line so that negatives are to the left and positive numbers are to the right. And so in this case, I want to include negative three. So I fill in that dot. I know that I want to include it because it's a less than or equal to symbol. I don't want to include four. And then I want to include all of the numbers that are in between negative three and four. And so the interval notation I use is the starting point, comma, the ending point. Square bracket means I want to include that number. Round parentheses means I don't want to include that number. So this would be my interval notation for this interval. So this would be numbers between negative three and four, including negative three, but not including four. Okay, let's get on to solving some equations. So in this case, we've got a linear equation, two X minus five equals six minus three X. So our strategy here is gonna to be to get all the X's together on the same side of the equation. So by doing uh, operations to both sides. So I'm gonna add three X to both sides, and I'm gonna add five to both sides. That's going to get all the x's on the left-hand side of the equation and everything that's not an x on the other side of the equation. So that gives me 5x. Those cancel out. 6 plus 5 is 11. And 3x and minus 3x cancel out. One last step. Divide both sides by 5. I get x equals 11 fifths. Okay, a little bit more complicated. This time we've got an equation with fractions. So when you're thinking about how to approach this equation, 
think about what is it that's preventing you from solving the equation. And what's preventing us from solving this equation at the moment is all of those crazy fractions. And the way that we're going to get rid of fractions is by multiplying. So we're going to multiply both sides of this equation by x minus 5. On the right-hand side, the x minus 5s divide out. On the left-hand side, we've got to be a little bit more careful because we have to distribute. x minus 5 is getting multiplied by everything on the left-hand side, not just that first fraction. So if your gut instinct was to just cross out the x minus 5s on the left-hand side, make sure that you slow yourself down in these kinds of problems and take it a little bit more slowly. So I've got x minus 5 times 2 over x minus 5 plus x minus 5 times 6. And on the right, I just have x minus 8. Now I can divide out the x minus 5s. So I get 2. If I distribute here, I get 6x minus 30 equals x minus 8. Now the fractions are gone, and this looks a lot more like the problem that we were just doing. So subtract x from both sides, I get 5x. 2 minus 30 is negative 28, so we'll add 28 to both sides, and that gives us 20 on the right-hand side. Divide both sides by 5, we get x equals 4. Okay, now we're looking at more complicated polynomial type of equations. So here we have x minus 1 times x plus 4 equals 0. Now again, your first instinct might be to start multiplying out the left-hand side. But let's stop for a second and think about this. We've got two things multiplied together equaling zero. And if you think about how we solve these kinds of polynomial equations, we actually like the fact that the right-hand side is zero. That's good news, because we know that the only way you can multiply two numbers together and get zero is if one of those numbers is zero. So either this is zero, or this is. And that gives us two simpler equations. That's the only way this product could be zero. The only way you can multiply two numbers together and get zero is if one of the numbers is zero. So that tells us that either x is one or x is negative four. So we have two solutions to this equation, x equals one or x equals negative four. Now this problem looks very similar, but notice that the right-hand side is no longer zero. Now it's 24. And there's lots of ways you can multiply two numbers together and get 24. 2 times 12, 24 times 1, 6 times 4, negative 6 times negative 4, right? There's lots and lots of ways to multiply those together. So now we can't just break this up like we did the previous problem. Now we really do have to multiply out the left-hand side. So we're going to FOIL that. x times x is going to be x squared. The O of the FOIL is x times 4 is going to be plus 4x. The i of the FOIL is going to be negative 1 times x, gives me minus x. And then the l of the FOIL is going to be negative 1 times 4, is going to be negative 4. So that gives me x squared plus 3x minus 4 equals 24. Now we want, remember, we want to have a 0 on the, on the right-hand side. So we're going to subtract 24 from both sides. And now we have x squared plus 3x minus 28 equals 0. And now our goal is to factor the left-hand side so that we get something that looks like the previous problem, so that we have a factored left-hand side and a right-hand side that equals 0. So how do we factor this? Well, the way we factor quadratics, we know we're going to have an x and an x. And we're looking for two numbers here that multiply together to be negative 28 and add together to be positive 3. So the way we're going to factor 28 is as a 7 and a 4. And since we want those to add together to be positive 3, we're going to have a plus 7 and a negative 4. That gives us two solutions, x plus 7 equals 0, so x equals negative 7, or x minus 4 equals 0, so x equals positive 4. So that's our solution to this quadratic. Okay, now let's talk about some logs and exponents a little bit. So we want to evaluate the log base 2 of 64. So the way this works, the definition of a logarithm here is when I write log base 2 of 64 equals x, right? That's the thing we're trying to figure out. What this means, the definition of the logarithm, is that 2 to the x equals 64. So in other words, what this question is asking is, what power do we need to raise 2 up to in order to get 64. So 2 to what number gives us 64? 
So we think two squared, that's four, two cubed, that's eight, two to the fourth, that's 16, we're getting closer, two to the fifth is 32, two to the sixth, that's 64. So the power that we're looking for is the number six. In this case, now we have a natural log. So ln just means log base e. So what this question is asking is, what power do we need to raise e up to? Remember, e is the special number 2.718 and so on, in order to get the thing inside, in this case, e to the 1.43. Well, when we say it that way, that's that's a pretty easy question, right? What power do I need to raise e up to to get e to the power 1.43? Well, the answer to that question is just 1.43, right? That's the power that I need. So one way of thinking about this is that this natural log and this exponential term essentially cancel each other out because natural log and exponentiation with base e are inverse functions. They do the opposite of each other. Now, all of this log stuff is usable, is useful for solving equations involving exponential expressions. So in this case, we've got 10 times e to the 2t equals 4. So we want to get that t by itself, but right now there's a whole lot of layers surrounding that t. So we've got to peel them off one by one. First thing I'm going to do is divide both sides by 10. So that gets the exponential expression by itself. e to the 2t equals 4 over 10, also known as 0.4. And now to get the variable out of the exponent, I'm gonna rewrite this equation in logarithmic form. And that's gonna give me the natural log of 0.4 equals 2t, right? Because 2t is the exponent. And so if I write that in log form, that's gonna equal the natural log of 0.4. And now all I have to do is divide both sides by two. So I get natural log of 0.4 divided by two. And when I talk about wanting an exact answer, that's the exact answer, right? It's in terms of natural log, right? So if I, if I type that into my calculator, I'm gonna get an approximate answer. I'm not gonna get the exact answer there. And sometimes the exact answer is what we want, and sometimes an approximate answer is what we want. Um, so in this case, I'm asking for both. And typically, especially when you go to start doing problems in the online homework system, exact answers are going to be what you're going to be looking for. They, they will occasionally ask you for an approximation, but they will tell you that, and they will also tell you how many decimal places you want. So in this case, when I type this into my calculator, natural log of 0.4 divided by 2 on my calculator is going to give me negative 0.458145 and so on. Since they want four decimal places, I'm going to stop after the 0.4581. The next digit is a 4, so I round down. And so 0.4581 is the answer that I want. Okay, now sometimes we have logarithmic equations that we want to solve. And again, remember that the fundamental principle here is that exponentiation and logarithms are opposite operations. In the previous problem, our variable was inside an exponent, so we used logs to get it out. In this case, our variable is inside a log, so we're going to use exponentiation to get it out. But in both cases, the operation has to be by itself. So before we can do anything here, we've got to divide both sides by 4. In this case, that gives us the log base 3 of 2x minus 1 equals 2. So this says that 2 is the power, right? The logarithm is the exponent. So the power you need to raise 3 up to to get 2x minus 1 is 2. So my 3 here, that's the base. The 2 here, that's the power. And the 2x minus 1, that's the result. So in equation form, that just means that 2x minus 1 is equal to 3 squared. So 2x minus 1 is 9, 2x equals 10, x equals 5. Okay, now let's talk trigonometry. All right, so first of all, let's talk about radians and degrees. So converting back and forth between radians and degrees, th there's a formula, there's, a, there's a, a, a rule for how to do that. But what if you forget that rule? What if you're not sure? Well, the way that I remember it is I think of a circle and I think to myself, well, this circle, so one circle, that's two pi radians, right? So hopefully that's something that you remember is that the whole circle is two pi. And also the whole circle is 360 degrees, right? Let me actually write out the word degree here, make it a little easier for us. 
So if 2 pi radians is 360 degrees, then 1 radian is going to be 360 divided by 2 pi degrees. Or in other words, 180 over pi. And that may be the conversion factor that you remember, right? 180 over pi. So that means that 7 pi over 6 radians, 7 pi over 6 radians, well, if 1 radian is 180 over pi, then 7 pi over 6 is going to be 7 pi over 6 multiplied by 180 over pi degrees. Because if 1 is 180 over pi, then however many I have is that number multiplied by 180 over pi. So the pi's divide out here. 6 goes into 180 30 times, and 7 times 30 is 210. So if you forget that conversion formula, you can kind of get it back, right? So you might have just remembered, oh, if I'm converting radians to degrees, I multiply by 180 over pi. And if you just remember that, then great. But if you forget it, then you're not just totally stuck, right? You can figure it out using your knowledge of circles. Now going the other way, converting degrees back to radians, same idea, right? So again, the principle is that 2 pi radians is equal to 360 degrees. So now the way I want to say this is that 1 degree is going to be 2 pi divided by 360 radians, or in other words, pi over 180. And so that means that 330 degrees, well, if 1 degree is pi over 180, then 330 degrees is 330 multiplied by pi over 180. And then all we have to do is reduce the fraction 330 over 180, which we can do pretty quickly. Divide by 10, divide by 3, we get 11 divided by 6. Can't reduce it any more than that, so we get 11 pi over 6 radians. All right, now what about trigonometric functions? Okay, so in this case, I want the sine of pi over 3. So sometimes uh, some folks have like the whole unit circle memorized. Um, the way that I approach this, it's a little bit less memorization, is I just remember the two special triangles. So the two special triangles are the 30, 60, 90 right triangle, which looks like this, 30 degrees, 60 degrees. If the hypotenuse is 1, then this side is 1 half, and this side is square root of 3 over 2. And the other special triangle is 45, 45, 90. And then in this case, if this side is 1 and this side is 1, then this side is the square root of 2. So pi over 3, again, just like we were doing before, we can convert that to degrees, we get 60 degrees. And sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So so ka toa, hopefully you remember that. So opposite over hypotenuse. So in this case, with my 60 degrees, my opposite is the 3 pi over 2, and the hypotenuse is 1. So the sine of pi over 3, that's the sine of 60 degrees radical 3 over 2 divided by 1, which is the same as just radical 3 over 2. Okay, now we've got cosine of negative 90 degrees. Well, that's not one of the angles in my special triangles, so now I've got to approach it from the unit circle point of view. So here's my unit circle. And on my unit circle, the sine is the y value, and the cosine is the x value. And we always start rotating from this positive x-axis. So that's where I start my rotation. I'm going to rotate by negative 90 degrees, which means I'm going to go clockwise. Negative rotations are clockwise. And so I end here. So this ray right here, that's my negative 90 degrees. And the point corresponding on the unit circle, that's this point right here, that's the point 0, comma, negative 1. And the cosine of that angle is the x-coordinate of that point. And so the cosine of negative 90 degrees is the x-coordinate of that point, which is 0. All right, same, guy, same basic idea. This time we've got tangent of 3 pi over 4. So again, that's not one of my nice angles. That's 135 degrees, which is not one of the nice angles in my triangles that I remember. So I approach it from the unit circle. 3 pi over 4 
is going to give me in quadrant two. So that's going to rotate me over to about here. So this is 135 degrees. And now, because that's not in quadrant one, right, because that's in quadrant two, I'm going to think about my reference angle. My reference angle is going to be the angle formed by that ray and the x-axis, which in this case is 45 degrees. And what you hopefully remember from trigonometry is that the tangent of 135 degrees is the same as the tangent of that reference angle up to maybe a plus or a minus. So we know that the tangent of 45 degrees from looking at that special triangle, that's one. So that means that the tangent of the angle that I'm looking at is either one or negative one. So how do I know which? Well, again, something you hopefully remember from trigonometry is that all of my trig functions are positive in quadrant one. Only the tangent of, of the three, right? Sine, cosine, and tangent. Only tangent is positive in quadrant three. My sine value is positive in quadrant two. The other two are negative. And the cosine value is positive in quadrant four. So these little labels here help you remember what's positive where. And again, that just has to do with where are x and y positive. So because in quadrant two, x is negative and y is positive, tangent, which is y over x, is going to be a positive divided by a negative. So that's going to be negative. So all of that put together tells me that my tangent of 3 pi over 4 is the tangent of 135 degrees, which is going to be minus the tangent of 45 degrees which is going to be negative one. So it's a lot of stuff in that, but hopefully that's all stuff that you at least vaguely remember from your, your pre-calculus, your trigonometry class that you took at some point. Okay, same basic approach. Going to do another one. This time it's cosecant, so we'll break that down, but 240 degrees. So here we at least don't have to convert from radians. We can just think about this in terms of degrees. 240 degrees is in quadrant three, so that's down here. There's my full rotation of 240 degrees. And my reference angle is going to be this angle right here, which is 60 degrees. So that means that the, to figure out the cosecant of 240, I've got to figure out the cosecant of 60, and then also figure out if I got to put a plus or a minus. So what's the cosecant of 60 degrees? Well, what you need to know about cosecant is that it's 1 over sine. So cosecant is 1 over sine. Thinking about the other trig functions, cotangent is 1 over tangent, and secant is 1 over cosine. So in this case, sine of 60 degrees, we already figured that out a few minutes ago. That's radical 3 over 2. So flip that over, we're going to get 2 over radical 3. So now the question is, what's the cosecant of 240 degrees? It's either 2 over radical 3 or it's minus 2 over radical 3. Which one is it? Well, again, we've got to think of our labels. So all of my trig functions are positive here. Sine is positive here tangent is positive here, cosine is positive there. What about cosecant, right? Well, cosecant goes along with sine, right? It's the reciprocal of sine. So cosecant of 240, that's one over the sine of 240. And since sine is negative in quadrant three, that means cosecant is negative in quadrant three. So it's negative two over radical three. So break it down, think about the reference angle, use your special triangles, and then figure out the sign using the ASTC labels. Okay, stepping away from trigonometry for a little while, let's talk about equations of lines. So here they're giving us two points, and we want the equation of the line that contains those two points. So the slope formula that we're going to use is m equals y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. So that's the rise divided by the run. So in this case, I'm going to label my points x1, y1, and x2, y2. So my y2 is 6, my y1 is negative 2, my x2 is negative 1, and my x1 is 3. So that's going to give me 8 divided by negative 4, which is negative 2. And now at this point, we have two options. So one option would be to use the point slope form, which is y minus y0 equals m x minus x0, where the x0 and the y0 can be either one of our points. So in this case, I'll just sort of arbitrarily choose the first point, y minus negative 2 equals negative 2 times x minus 3. So that's y plus 2 equals negative 2 
x plus 6, subtract 2 from both sides, I get negative 2x plus 4. And that would be my final answer. Alternatively, we can just plug into the y equals mx plus b. We know that the m is negative 2, and we're trying to figure out what the b is. So again, we can take either one of our points and plug it into this and solve for b. So since I chose the first point uh, in the previous solution method, I'll choose the second point this time. So I get y, which is 6, equals negative 2, minus 1, plus the b. So that's 6 equals 2 plus b, so b equals 4. And that means my y equals mx plus b is negative 2x plus 4. It's the same solution, just a different way of getting it. And either one of these is fine. So whichever method that you choose, whichever method you prefer for that is totally fine. All right, so for this one, we're again being asked for the equation of a line. This time they're giving us the information in a different way. So they're telling us we want the line that's parallel to 2x minus 3y equals 10, and we want it to pass through the point 7 comma negative 1. So in this case, parallel just means same slope. So what's the slope of 2x minus 3y equals, equals 10? Well, it's not really in the y equals mx plus b form that we would like it to be, so let's put it in that form. Let's add 3y to both sides, subtract 10 from both sides, divide both sides by 3. And again, it's not still not quite in the mx plus b format, so let's write this as 2 thirds x minus 10 thirds. So that means that the m is 2 thirds. And now I have the slope and I have a point. So just like in the previous problem, we've got two options, two ways of figuring out what the b is. I'm going to go ahead and use the point slope form again. So y minus y0 equals m x minus x0. Again, I know that the slope is 2 thirds and my point is x0 is 7 and my y0 is negative 1. So that's going to be y plus 1 equals 2 thirds x. 2 thirds times negative 7 is negative 14 thirds. Subtract 1 from both sides. 1 is 3 thirds, so negative 14 thirds minus 3 thirds, that's negative 17 thirds. And so there's my equation. Okay, so now we've got some word problems, just some sort of problem solving type things we're going to be talking about here. So in this case, they're telling us two sides of a right triangle are 3 and 5. What are the possible lengths of the third side? So there's actually two possibilities here, right? So if I draw my triangle, what are the different ways that I could label it? Well, maybe the first way that you thought of was put the 3 there and put the 5 there. And that's certainly fine. If I call that third side c, Pythagorean theorem is going to tell me 3 squared plus 5 squared equals c squared, 9 plus 25, so c equals square root of 34. Right, c can't be negative because it's a length. Otherwise, we would get plus or minus the square root of 34. But that's not the only way to draw my triangle. It could be that the 3 is there and the 5 is the hypotenuse. And then my other side, maybe I'll call it b. So that would give me another way of figuring out what that third side could be. So 3 squared plus b squared equals 5 squared. 9 plus b squared equals 5 squared. b squared equals 16. b equals 4. So really, these are the two possible solutions. There's no other way that I could label this triangle, right? I couldn't have one of the legs be 5 and the hypotenuse be 3, because then that can't make a triangle. You can't have the hypotenuse not be the longest side. So that's how we solve this one. So now we've got a piece of wire, x inches long. It's bent into the shape of a square. So we're starting with this straight line segment that's x, and we wrap it around into a square shape. And we want to find the area of that square in terms of x. Well, if I think of the sides of the square as maybe being little s, I know that the area is s squared. But I also know that because this square came from that initial piece of wire from x, I know that s plus s plus s plus s, the perimeter of that square, that has to equal my x. So 4s is x, which means s is x over 4, which I can plug into my area formula. x over 4 squared, which works out to be x squared over 16. And so that's my area in terms of x, right? In terms of x just means I want a formula with only x's in it. So now it's a very similar question. Now we're taking our piece of wire that's x units long, x inches long, and we're wrapping it around into a circular shape. And again, we're going to use our knowledge of the area formula for that circle. We know that if the radius is r, the area is pi r squared. But that's not in terms of x. So we need to figure out what's the relationship between x and r. Well, we know that the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r. 
and the circumference is that x, because that's the length of wire that we started when we wrapped around it in the circle. So r is going to be x over 2 pi, and so we plug that in, we get pi times x over 2 pi squared. That's pi times x squared over 4 pi squared. One of those pi's divides out with the pi on the top, so we get x squared over 4 pi. All right, another type of problem. Here we've got a shape that's formed by different curves in the xy plane. So we've got a line y equals 20 minus 3x that's going to look something like that. It's got slope negative 3, so it goes down as I go from left to right, and it's got y-intercept 20, which means this point right here is 0, 20. So I've got the positive x-axis, the positive y-axis, and the line x equals 4. So the line x equals 4 is going to be a vertical line that looks something like that. So there's 4 on my x-axis, so this is x equals 4. So the shape that we're talking about is this shape right here. Now that shape is a trapezoid, and maybe you know the formula for the area of the trapezoid, but I'm going to go out on a limb and, and guess maybe you don't. So instead what we're going to do is we're going to take this shape and break it up into a triangle sitting on top of a rectangle, because I hope that you know the formulas for the area of a rectangle and the formula for the area of a triangle. So the area here is going to be 1 half base times height. The area here is just going to be base times height. So all we have to do is figure out the dimensions of these shapes the bases and the heights, and then we can figure out what the total area is going to be. Okay, so what's the base? Well, the base here is just going to be 4, because it's 4 going from left to right. So that's pretty easy. What about the heights? Well, the total height of this trapezoid, this entire distance here, that's 20. So how does that 20 break up into the height of the rectangle and the height of the triangle? Well, that's really going to hinge on what the coordinates of this point right here are. I know the x-coordinate of that point is 4, because that's on the line x equals 4. What's the y-coordinate? Well, that's where this formula is going to come into play, 20 minus 3x. If I plug 4 into that, 20 minus 3 times 4, that's 20 minus 12, that's 8. Which means the height of the rectangle is 8, so this distance is 8. And since the whole height has to be 20, this remaining height here has to be 12. All right, now let's plug into our formulas. So 1 half, base is 4, height of the triangle is 12, so that's 1 half times 4 times 12, that's 24. For the rectangle, the base is 4, and the height is 8, 4 times 8 is 32. Since the entire shape is made up out of those two smaller shapes, we add those two areas together, and we get a total of 56. Okay, now we've got some cars driving around. So a car is traveling east at 50 miles an hour, passing through an intersection at noon, and then at 2 p.m., a car traveling west at 40 miles an hour passes through the same intersection. We're assuming that the cars maintain that direction and that speed, so how far apart are the cars at 3 p.m.? So they're going east and west, so we can just have a single line here, right? So here's the intersection. And let's think about where car, you know, we'll call them A and B, right? So here's car A and here's car B. So at 12 o'clock, the car A is at the intersection. So 12 p.m., A is here. And it's going east, which means in my picture, right, normal cardinal directions, north, south, east, west. So that means it's traveling to the right. So at 1 p.m., the car is here, car A is here. 2 p.m., it's here. 3 p.m., it's here. And it's going 50 miles an hour, which means it's gone 50 plus 50 plus 50. So this whole distance here is 150 miles. All right, what about car B? Well, we don't know where car B is until 2 o'clock. But at 2 o'clock, car B is at the intersection. And car B is traveling west at 40 miles an hour, which means car B goes to the left. And so at 3 p.m., car B has gone to the left. And it's going 40 miles an hour, which means it's gone 40 miles to the left. So the total distance is going to be the 40 miles that B is to the left and the 150 miles that A is to the right added together. So the total distance here is just going to be 190 miles. So drawing a picture and kind of thinking about the different stages of the scenario can really help you figure out what's going on here. Okay, a very similar problem, but I changed one word. And the one word I changed was that now car B is traveling south. So again, keeping our normal cardinal directions, north, south, east, west. 
now I need a two-dimensional picture. So here's the intersection. And just like we said before, at 3 p.m., car A is 150 miles to the right. But now at 3 p.m., instead of car B being 40 miles to the left, car B is 40 miles to the south. So that's where car B is at 3 p.m. And the distance between the two cars is going to be this distance right here, this diagonal distance. But that's a right triangle. And we can figure out the hypotenuse of that right triangle using the Pythagorean theorem. That's going to give us c squared is 24,100. So c is the square root of 24,100, which if you want an approximation on your calculator, that's approximately 155.24 miles. So again, drawing a picture, thinking about the scenario can really help with problems like this. And that's it. So again, this wasn't intended to cover absolutely every possible scenario, right? Even though it was 32 questions, there's still lots of other sort of algebra tips and tricks and things that you've learned over your years of taking math classes that will come up as we go along. But hopefully this hits the highlights. If you've noticed any trouble spots or anything that totally blew you away or you weren't sure about, like I said, come, uh, come and see me and ask for help and I can give you plenty more practice. So have a great day and I hope this helped.